Problems with probability. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the conversation. I'm David Schuster. There is a growing concern across the issues of math and science and research. A number of investigators have determined that they're having what's known as a replication crisis. I'll give you an example. Basically, replication crisis is you can't repeat something that was done several years ago and find the same sort of data that it doesn't hold true. So for example, several years ago, there was a study that found that if you force people to smile by putting a pen in their mouth, well, they would, they would smile for a period of time and it would make them happier. But when the same experiment was done decades later, the researchers, after doing it with 2,000 people, found that the data did not show that at all. So there's a fundamental theory that something has gone terribly wrong across society with how we use data. And here to talk about that is Dr. Aubrey Clayton. He is a mathematician, teacher, a uh, philosophy of probability and statistics at the Harvard Extension School. His book is Bernoulli's Fallacy. Bernoulli was a mathematician from several hundred years ago, sort of like the founding father of statistics. And uh, Dr. Clayton, uh, I imagine that's part of the problem here. Yes, it is. That's right. So the book traces the history of a mistaken idea of probability and statistics that originated with Jacob Bernoulli about 300 years ago. So it's a very long history and a rich history. And unfortunately, now that mistake is incredibly widespread and, and embedded in the standard methods of statistics as they're used across experimental science and, and in many other domains. So how does that manifest itself? I gave the example about you know research about how one makes how, you know how you decide whether uh, something might make somebody happy with a smile, but how does it manifest itself with sort of the very serious issues uh, facing our society today? Yeah. So the the essence of the fallacy, um, as I describe in the book, is that the probability statements that people use to draw conclusions from data, be it observational data, experimental data, evidence at a a crime scene, what have you. Um, all those probability statements are oriented in the wrong direction. So essentially, they all start from an assumption of a hypothesis, say that a scientific theory is true, or that a suspect committed a crime, or that a patient has a disease. And then they can tell you the probability of certain observations based on that. How often would such a person test positive for the disease, let's say. Um, but the correct direction to really be using to draw conclusions is the other way around. We're not always interested in how likely is it that you would get a certain observation if, let's say, a theory were true. What we want to know is, given a certain observation, what's the probability we assign to that theory being true, say, uh, someone truly having a disease. And in the case of um, experimental science, that amounts to saying things like, what's the probability that you can really make somebody happy by forcing them to smile. And in order to do that assessment, you need to bring into the calculation the prior knowledge that you have of that theory. You have to have an assignment for the probability that you'd say that theory is true without interpreting the data yet. And that's called the prior probability, which in Bayesian statistics is a core component, is not used in the standard mode of statistics um, that's, that's um, dominant today. I mean, I'm going to ask you about Bayesian statistics in just a moment, but let's use another example. You mentioned a law enforcement crime. There was a famous case that you point out in your book in which a woman was convicted, even though she was innocent. She was convicted of murdering her two children because both kids died from SIDS. And the argument was, well, that's a statistical improbability, impossibility that she could, that she could have two children die from SIDS. And you point out in the book that that was the wrong way to look at it. Explain why. Yes, that's right. So the person you're referring to was Sally Clark, who was wrongfully convicted of the murder of her two infant children because um, they died a, a few years apart um, very unexpectedly. And the key piece of evidence that was presented at her trial was that for uh, a couple and a family such as hers, it would be very, very unlikely to have two children die of SIDS. Um, so that is to say by chance without there being um, some kind of foul play. And that argument has the probability oriented in the wrong direction. It is to say, if she was not guilty of murdering her children, it would be very, very unlikely that they would die for other reasons. Um, where the, the correct direction that they should have been asking at the trial is given that they died, what's the probability that we would assign to the theory that she was a murderer? And in order to do that assignment, you would have to take into consideration, for example, the fact that it's very, very unlikely for two children to die of homicide in a family as well. And so the, the prior probability, the probability that we'd assign to that hypothesis or that theory of the case itself should have been extremely low. 
And in the end, what we're trying to do is balance or find the balance between two competing theories of the case, given this extremely unlikely evidence that we, um, we've observed. Now, there are people in law enforcement and across the scientific world who would say, okay, let's use that example that maybe there's nothing wrong with looking at her based on the odds or the probability that somebody would have two children die from SIDS, but that that should not be a factor at trial. Do you agree with that? That at least that can be perhaps the first clue or the first reason to trigger some investigation based on something that seems so highly improbable? It should certainly be part of the larger calculation. So absolutely the fact that it's a very unlikely occurrence. The number presented at her trial was um, that the chances were one in 73 million to have two children die of unexplained causes uh, within the same family. And that can be an ingredient to sussing out and, and investigating the different kinds of possibilities and coming to a conclusion about whether she was likely um, guilty of the crime she was accused of. The point that, that I am trying to make in the book, and I think what is clear when you actually kind of think through the logic of that argument is that that can't be the end point. You also have to take into consideration that it's very unlikely from the start that just a random person off the street would be a double murderer or um, you know, any other kind of theory that you have to explain the case. You have to uh, weigh the, the balance of probability for that theory against um, the theory of random chance or in this case, SIDS. So it's, it's an ingredient, but it's only one ingredient of many. And the problem with these statistical methods that try to argue from just that one probability is that they leave out all of the other pertinent information. How does this work out then against something that's you know topical like say COVID and whether or not people should get vaccines or whether people should wear masks? Yeah, so well, one, one way that it plays out in COVID that I think everyone probably is familiar with now having been through um, a year and a half of testing is that we might have, for example, test statistics or um, statistics that describe the accuracy rates of tests. And those can tell you, for example, if someone has the virus, what's the probability that they'll test positive for it? Or if they don't, what's the probability that they'll test negative? But in order to um, make an actionable decision from a test result, you really need to know then what's the probability given the test result that you have the virus. And it's the turning that probability around the other way um, is the key, the key idea. And in order to do that, you have to include things like what symptoms do you have? What kinds of exposure levels have you had? What are the case rates like in your community? And if those aren't part of your calculation, then you're doing the probability assignment incorrectly. Would that also include say family medical history, whether you have underlying conditions or the whole sort of gamut that it's not just about, okay, you test positive, therefore it means you have COVID. It's well, what, what, what are all the other factors that may be at play in your particular case, is that fair? Yes, exactly, that's right. So it, 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 the same dynamic is at play in say the clinical trials of the vaccine effectiveness or uh, any other kind of drug effectiveness that from the beginning, there should be an, ass, an assessment of what's the likelihood that this drug is effective before we've taken into consideration the data. So if you are, for example, doing a trial, a clinical trial on a new vaccine, and you are comparing that to a clinical trial on a homeopathic remedy, you should start from the point of view of a higher prior probability for the vaccine being effective than you would for a crystal or you know, homeopathic remedy. And the, the, the problem with scientific statistics is that it doesn't include that kind of foreknowledge. And that gets to the Bayesian approach, which is another philosophy, another sort of strand of statistical analysis, but suggests that you should incorporate prior knowledge when trying to reason with incomplete information. In the case of say COVID-19 and vaccines, as you mentioned, it would say, well, wait a second, given all the progress that has been made with these vaccines, we start at this particular baseline. The problem with that is that there are some people who are anti sansman who may say, well, what about the fact that you're, you're cooking the books now? Yeah, and I think that that's, that's a, a fairly cynical way to look at it. I would make the argument the other way, which is to say that um, by not taking advantage of the accumulated knowledge that we have as scientists and as a scientific community, we're essentially artificially leveling the playing field and cooking the books the other way. We're giving um, theories that really have no basis in scientific fact too great of a chance to prove themselves through the data. So like the, the social psychology theory you mentioned of, forcing someone to be happy by putting a pen in their teeth. We should assign that a very low prior probability because we have a kind of world history and we have accumulated knowledge about 
people and the way that their psychology works that should allow us to discount that possibility. Not completely, we could still allow ourselves to be convinced of it, but we just need to raise the bar for theories that contradict kind of our prior understanding of the world. And that's as it should be. And finally, real quickly here, and I know we're running short on time. Um, how would this play out in terms of looking in the future if scientists and researchers use the Bayesian approach? Would it cost a lot more? Would it fundamentally change how research is done, how research is interpreted? Well, it would fundamentally change how research is um, interpreted and explained and the kind of statistical arguments that are used to support research. Um, my argument in the book is actually that it would be in the end, a great cost savings to researchers because there's an enormous amount of money that's wasted on failed studies that that don't replicate or on the replication studies themselves to establish whether those things were legitimate in the first place. And by using the data more efficiently through Bayesian methods, actually a lot of money could be saved, a lot of time and effort could be saved and scientists could get, get back to doing the business of real science. Dr. Aubrey Clayton, the book is Bernoulli's Fallacy. Dr. Clayton, thanks so much for joining us, we appreciate it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Got it. Welcome back to the conversation. I'm David Chester. So, what happens when Mount Trashmore in Virginia Beach leaks? I got some relatives down there, and that particular landfill, that dump, is right by the sea. And there are, of course, great concerns that sea levels are going to rise perhaps by eight feet over the next 80 years. And Mount Trashmore, of course, is not the only landfill. There are plenty of them and toxic waste dumps that are in danger in case the seawaters continue to rise. Well, this is one of the underreported issues in global warming, except at the nation where Dave Lindorf has been writing about this and doing some investigative work. He is a contributor to the nation. Dave, thanks for joining us. How many of these sites are say within 10 feet of current sea levels? Uh, half of all the landfills known to exist in the country, which is 100,000 are at that you know they're in the 30 odd counties that uh, where they are at least uh, or no more than 10 feet above sea level. And they were not built to withstand sea levels rising and essentially breaching their banks or their walls, right? No, no, most of them all except about 3000 currently functioning <laughs> landfills were, um, were uh, put in the ground before anyone ever thought about sea level rise. They go back you know, as far as 150 years and, uh, and we don't even know what's in them before if they were before 1980. So they, we, don't, we don't know where some of them are and we don't know what's in the bottoms of any of them. One would assume that a lot of these would be toxic if they started seeping into groundwater and oceans and, and everything else. Well, think about the fact that before 1980, when the US really began deindustrializing, there was uh, industry in almost every community, uh, you know, except in rural areas. And, and the, those industries would dump whatever uh, they had in their process, you know, industrial process that was toxic, would just go in a truck and go to the local landfill and be dumped. And there was no requirement to record what you were putting in. Uh, there was no rules about what could go in. And so that the, all these dumps that predate 1980 have like everything in them. I found one in the, one of the 13 closed dumps in the New Jersey Meadowlands that actually has waste from the uh, Manhattan Project. <laughs> so how fearful are scientists about the, about the breach of these dumps and landfills and toxic waste sites? Well, when you, when you ask a scientist, an environmental scientist about a landfill, say like what's in the New Jersey Meadowlands or, uh, or down along the Gulf Coast uh, near Houston or something, and you ask them, they'll say, oh God, that would be horrible if that got into the bayous or into the you know, Raritan River estuary or whatever. Um, but nobody has thought of this systemically. I, my article is the first case of this being examined in the United States ever. And everybody I talk to says, gee, I never thought of that. You know, landfill managers, uh, coastal planners, nobody. Nobody's thought about the fact that all of these 50,000 landfills are at risk of being inundated and ripped open. Hmm. Now, it's not a seepage that's the problem, it's, yeah, it's being ripped open. 
a lot of people are freaked out by your article and the idea of seepage and, and all the poisonous chemicals sort of going to the water. And there seems to be, I'm sure people are gonna react and say, okay, let's start cleaning things up. But you point out there's an incentive, there's sort of a perverse incentive for politicians right now not to clean it up. Explain that. Yeah, this was explained to me by a, a, a climate scientist, Harold Wanless, a very well known sea level rise expert and ice melt expert. And he was saying that. Um, the politics of it are that landfills are all locally controlled, locally owned, locally managed and monitored by state governments. And politicians at the state level and especially at the local level uh, don't see their careers as being local or state. They all are looking to go where the money and power is, which is in Washington. So they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of constitutionally uh, un, incapable of doing things that are going to raise taxes locally and ruin their electoral chances of moving upward. And and they figured they're going to be gone, uh, hopefully in their view, um, to other things before any of this is going to uh, redound on them for not having dealt with it. Yeah, so why, why spend the money right now if you're a local mayor or governor? Why spend the money now on something that may not be a problem for decades from now? Even though decades from now, it'll be that much more expensive and and financially uh, terrible for all of us, right? And and even too late, you know, at some point. I mean, if these things are surrounded by water, it's going to be very hard to move them. Hmm. Um, is there any idea about whether the, the original businesses, the oil companies, the coal mining companies, all the rest that did this dumping, can they be forced to clean some of this up? There are some efforts already. Uh, this, the uh, city of Baltimore, the state of Massachusetts, the state of Rhode Island, the state of California, um, Imperial City in California, places are suing uh, the oil industry. Uh, the major ones, uh, and saying, you brought this on, you uh, lied and pressured Congress and the EPA not to act on it, you, again, you know, on global warming, you brought the sea level rise. And so we need to, uh, you need to pay for it. And it's going into the courts, um, some success, but you know, the, the real problem is that now we have a Supreme Court that is not going to be very, um, you know, amenable to supporting that kind of an argument hmm. at the end of the line. It does seem, I mean, the argument that sea levels are rising now seems to be embraced even by a lot of conservatives. They will say, well, it's, man, man has nothing to do with it. The sea levels rise because temperatures go up, temperatures go down, whatever. But there is this uh, theory on the right that, well, why should we suffer economically now? I mean, we might as well just ask humans to do what they've always done, and that is to adapt to it. Is it possible to adapt? As the kids at Fox and Friends say, when you have toxic waste dumps that are seeping into the water? Well, for one thing, you know, if you look at the recommendations, they've been dealing with uh, three to four feet recommendation uh, or predictions from the IPCC. Now the IPCC is, is saying six feet. Uh, NOAA says eight and a half feet are the maximums. When you plan crisis, you ensure your home, anything. You plan for the worst case scenario so that if it happens, you're set. You don't plan for the, the minimum, right? And what they're all doing is looking at the minimum. And, and they also are looking at uh, 2100 as kind of a goalpost. And if they can get there, it's touchdown in their home. You know, or, or home, I just did, you know, second game. <laughs> it's like home base, home plate. You know, they got there, they're in, it's over. But that's not what happens at 2100, then the seas are gonna be rising faster and they're gonna to continue to rise because of what's baked into the atmosphere temperature So, uh, and the ice melt. So it, it's not the end, even if it is an eight and a half feet by, uh, by 2200, um, it's going to be 2210, 2220, and it's gonna keep rising. So it, these things are all going to be underwater, and major cities are going to be underwater too. So you know that l argument that people make is nuts. 
And there's uh, there's also, I guess, this appreciation now, at least among, you know, for example, when I tell this to my relatives in Virginia Beach, and I started this segment by talking about them. I mean, Virginia Beach is in danger because of sea levels rising anyway. But I suppose we we will reach a point in our society where people realize, you know what, if I want to hold on to the value that I have of my property, I need to sell before this becomes a crisis because we will all start, you know, our our children, our grandchildren will start to calculate uh, years from now where to buy property based on, okay, what are the dangers? to those areas from sea levels rising and is there a toxic waste dump that might breach near where we live that could ruin life there? Well, right? actually, this is, an, this is another reason why they need to move quickly because um, what's going to happen is the insurance industry is going to recognize that uh, they want out because then they're not gonna renew insurance on properties along the shore because that'll be a catastrophe for them. And the other thing that, that uh, Professor Wanless pointed out is that if, if communities wait to deal with these landfills, um, the prices start will start to drop soon, and then their tax base will collapse, and they won't even have the money to do anything uh, with these problems that that we're facing. You know, like the landfills or like the infrastructure of the water and sewers and things like that. Is this primarily sure. just a problem in the United States, or is it a, is there a similar problem for countries around the world that also have coastlines and, and oceans? It's global. The only reason ours is so huge is because our waste pile is so huge. We we produce 250 million tons of garbage per year, um, but and a lot of it gets shipped to third world countries. Remember, like Indonesia, Ghana, you know, other African nations with coastlines, and they get put on on the shores. The other point I'll make, because we're running out of time, is that. 70% of sea life in the oceans has some part of their breeding cycle in the wetlands where most of these dumps are located. And, and so those are all in jeopardy. So we're not just talking about pollution that's annoying. It's gonna kill off vast quantities of sea life by ruining how they breed. Yeah, that's such a good point because never mind what happens inland, what happens in the first couple of miles in the ocean where so much of the sea life exists will also be destroyed and irreparably harmed. Um, it is a terrifying article, but one that I hope everybody reads and perhaps it sparks some sort of action in communities and states across the United States and also in places around the world. Uh, Dave Lindorf, he's a contributor, investigative reporter for The Nation. Dave, thanks so much for joining us, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. You got it, and that'll do it for this edition of The Conversation on behalf of Asher Cofield and the rest of the gang at the Young Turks. I'm David Schuster, thanks for watching.